morning, Counselor. Good morning, Cora. How was your weekend? Can you hear me? Now I can. I couldn't a second ago. You were muted. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I'm kind of <laughs> still new at this thing. <laughs> How was your weekend? Sound Come check. On. Sound check. Yep. Can hear you great, Michael. Thank you. And good morning. Hi, Counselor. How are you? Very good. Miss everybody. I know. Likewise. I know. It's weird not to see each other in the flesh. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's terrible. We're living through terrible times. Hopefully things will get better soon. Indeed. Yeah. Cora, are you the one compiling this question list? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Michelle is going to be doing the uh, the questions on this one. I'll be I'll be doing the minutes. Okay. Perfect. Thanks so much. And Candace, it says you're screen sharing, but it's just dark. Good morning, counselor. Good morning. How are you? Oh, hanging in there. <laughs> Can't believe it's Monday already. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. How are you doing? Good. Good. Similarly, it's uh, it was a busy weekend, and here we are again. Yeah. But uh, lots to do. Lots to do. On all fronts. Indeed. Let's see if I can join this other meeting. I'm multitasking here, yeah. so I'm going to put you on mute. Sounds good. See you later. So Lee's a daddy. I saw that. Amazing news. Yes. <laughs> so I think his, his, uh, his schedule is going to change dramatically. Uh, his ability to uh, jump to things, and I think it's going to be different. Yes, I would say so. Uh, yeah. So we'll see how it all unfolds the next day or next week or two. But I'd say it's also it's a great time to spend uh, time with your newborn. So that's awesome. Yeah. 
All right, we're just gonna wait like two more minutes and then we'll get going. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. That food is. You're in. Excellent. Did you have a good weekend? Yeah, it was great. You, Mama. What? You, Mom. Uh, yeah, we talked. It was nice. She's good. Um, I don't know. My sister got a promotion at work, so we toasted that. Oh, nice. Uh, Very good. But yeah, I don't know. I was busy. I've got, um, I'm like snatching moments for grading on, in my class. So <laughs> it's like <laughs> the weekend's the only time to try to get some of that done, but I don't know. Oh, all right. <sighs> um, anyways, I think we're, we're live and we're going to not, we're going to, um, <clears throat> jump in a second. um, how was your mother's day, Anissa? Oh, it was great, Kim. How was yours? Good. All right. I slept in, which was really nice. I can't sleep in. I well, I, I mean, I slept till eight. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, if I could sleep till eight, that'd be the blessing. <laughs> like, hey, just right? everyone, I, just so everyone knows, we are live on YouTube. I just oh, wanna... <laughs> yeah, sorry, I forgot. Yeah. No, it's all good. Um, <laughs> all right, everyone. Uh, All right, if I Okay. All right, everyone, I think we're gonna get going. I'm calling this meeting of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee to order. Um, for the record, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the District 8 City Councilor and also the chair of this committee. Um, we today are broadcasting this working session. Um, it's being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. Um, and it'll be rebroadcast on Comcast channel eight RCN channel 82 and Verizon channel 1964. Um, so the council's budget review process this year involves both working sessions and um, public hearings. The working sessions are designed as an opportunity for counselors to generate questions in advance of the following week's hearings. And as such, they're not open to public testimony, um, but we are taking public testimony in a number of forums on the budget. So you can go to one of the public hearings and uh, attach to every public hearing notice online. There's a Zoom link and then you can um, wait in the Zoom waiting room and testify at the end of the hearing that way. Um, we do ask people to continue to watch it on that um, live stream link. You can also come to one of our dedicated public testimony hearings, which we'll be having at 6 p.m. on May 26th, which is a Tuesday focused on BPS and at 6 p.m. on May 28th focused on other departments. Um, you can also, at a time in your convenience, um, submit a two minute video through our web portal um, or send written testimony. Um, the city's council's website's website about the budget is boston.gov slash council dash FY21 budget. So you can go there to see how to submit the testimony or you can email it to ccc.wm at boston.gov. Um, and you can also informally tweet us your questions using the hashtag boss budget, the OS budget. So we look forward to having your involvement. Um, obviously we're in uncertain and uh, challenging times right now. 
Um, and the city's still got to have a budget and figure out how we move forward to meet those times. So we're continuing with this budget scrutiny process. Um, today's hearing is on docket 0588 to 0590, orders for the FY21 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, for the school department, and for other post-employment benefits, OPEB, docket 0591 to 0592, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations, and docket 0593 to 0596, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Those are the set of dockets that kind of make up the city's FY21 budget. Um, there is additionally, we're also gonna be discussing today, docket 0606 to 0608, which are orders to authorize the limits for BPS revolving funds. Um, so our focus areas in this working session today will be, will be the Boston Public Schools and specifically um, the commitments two, three, and four in the strategic plan. Um, commitment two, accelerated learning. Our discussion will include discussion of early education, the Office of Elementary Schools, the Office of Secondary Schools, Excellence for All, and Advanced Work Classrooms, Science Education, Vocational Education, Art and Music, Libraries, Special Curricular Programs such as the AP and the IB, Mass Core Standards, and the MCAS. Um, so, you know, I would say for the shorthand, that hearing, which is going to take place in the morning on May 19th, is really focused on the academic programs of BPS um, in sort of all forms. And then um, in the afternoon on the 19th, we'll be looking at BPS commitments to amplify all voices and expand opportunity um, focused on parent and youth engagement, um, parent and youth role in governance, school admission and assignment, um, and uh, and other and other such things. Um, and I think one second, it's not in my um, uh, yeah, and we will also and then we'll also be discussing in that afternoon hearing build BPS, which is the component of the city's capital plan related to the schools. And as I mentioned before, the BPS revolving funds. Um, so those are sort of a whole wide set of topics for us to tackle at those hearings and that therefore we're going to generate questions on at this working session. As counselors will remember, we focused on the opportunity and achievement gap um, and then specifically inclusion and special ed um, and language, um, dual language programs in our uh, hearings with BPS last week. Um, and there will also be another round of hearings with BPS um, later in May that will focus on um, issues around the central office, transportation, food, athletics, learning loss replacement, summer school partnerships, et cetera. So those things are, are sort of the next tranche of issues, but the ones I listed at the start are the ones we're dealing with today. Um, so without further ado, I wanna recognize my colleagues who've joined us in, their, or in the order of arrival, and then we'll just jump right into generating questions on these topics. So um, I've been joined by Councillor Michael Flaherty at large, Councillor Liz Breeden um, of District 9, Councillor Anissa Sabi George, also at large, Councillor Kim Janey, District 7 and Council President, Councillor Julia Mejia at large, Councillor Lydia Edwards, District 1, Councillor Matt O'Malley, District 6, and Councillor Ricardo Arroyo of District 5. Um, so we'll jump right in. I'm not going to segment it today. People can throw out you know, questions on whichever of the, these topics they want to talk about. So um, Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I spoke to some early um, childhood education teachers over the weekend, they had concerns, um, just feeling that um, the sort of the Chrome book transition was a little bit more difficult um, for them with um, sort of the younger students, you know, the kindergarten, first, second, third grade. And they couldn't say enough about the library tech specialists and the role that they played in helping them sort of transition and get uh, these um, youngsters uh, up to speed in terms of how they can engage them via the Chromebook. So moving forward, if, um, you know, if our classroom is referenced uh, this morning's call with the mayor talking about if we go back in the fall and there's going to be sort of two sessions, I really think particularly for our younger uh, children, um, those tech specialists are going to be critical um, for teaching and learning moving forward. So, um, you know, and, 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 and that obviously dovetails with our special needs students as well, so that we're not leaving anyone behind. So, just wanted to flag that um, for uh, for this uh, for this call, and whether or not um, the sufficient funds um, that that uh, allocated that allow for that, given this sort of the new day that we're finding our schools in. So, and again, that was from um, several conversations with um, you know kindergarten for a second, third grade teachers. They they did feel that they 
had a couple additional hurdles to jump over uh, uh, that were did not exist for for sort of older students and for their for their fellow colleagues. And um, that was the order that they wanted us to put in the water for them that uh, that they did that they do have uh, additional hurdles given that the kids are so young. Uh, some of those teachers, just for everyone's edification, they literally went out to some of these homes um, to identify who didn't have internet connections and who was in some of the hot spots, and they were relaying that information back. So uh, typical of our teachers um, to sort of take matters into their own hands to make sure that their students are getting what they need. And uh, when teachers were seeing that a couple of students were not on, um, they went out and, and uh, made sure that they were able to get connected. So that was good to hear. But um, so just want to flag uh, library tech specialist in, uh, special needs specialist uh, for the younger kids. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Flaherty. Um, next up is Councillor Breeden, and then it'll be Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Breeden? Councillor Breeden, you just need to unmute. One second, Councillor Breeden. Okay, having a hard time. Liz, we can't hear you. Okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip Councillor Breeden for a second, and then uh, we'll go back to you um, at an appropriate time. Uh, Councillor Asabi George, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and. Um... Thank you for everyone who's here this morning. Just a, one question I'd add to Michael's question around some of the early ed uh, questions that he had is the uh, questions around the inclusive preschool grant. So for universal pre-K, there is uh, some efforts around the inclusive preschool being phased in over three years starting in fiscal year 18. So FY. Um, starting in FY18, so FY20 is the first school year. So I'm just curious as, a, as to some of that effort and how that effort, um, talk a little, I'd like them to talk a little bit more about that funding and how this, um, how this grant sort of affects our goals around increasing pre access to pre-K seats. So that, that's the question I have on early ed. Most of my questions, and, I'll, and I'm happy to do this in a couple of rounds so I don't take away from my colleagues' questions, are around vocational ed, accelerated learning, uh, mass course standards, especially around science, arts, and music. Uh, the MCAS has been canceled due to COVID-19, and I'm just wondering how that will impact um, some of the scholarship opportunities that students would traditionally have access to. Uh, but I'll focus right now this little segment on voc vocational and technical education. And you know, over the last number of years, a number of us have been really at, really strongly advocating for uh, vocational technical ed here in Boston, in particular supporting Madison Park. Um, and it seems that we're um, going through some changes at Madison Park, both uh, some that are creating added confidence in what's happening at Madison, and then some that is really stretching stretching uh, some of the stability concerns that we have at, at Madison. So um, I'm just curious as, as to sort of the state of affairs at Madison Park, both from a leadership perspective, uh, organizing the curriculum and the, the programs that are happening at Madison and really understanding the role um, that Madison has as a part of our school system. In particular, I've advocated the last few years that Madison have received a significant investment from Build BPS. So um, just sort of looking for information on that. And then um, some concerns around the admissions policy. We've, we've been working to change the admissions policy at Madison and just curious about that. So I'm gonna, that's, that's sort of my first batch of questions. I have more, but I'm gonna save it. And I think that there might be something wrong with my audio on Zoom. So I'm gonna log out and log back in. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, well, it was all it was all audible for us, and uh, thank you, Councillor Asabi George. Um, all right, uh, Councillor Breeden, are are you able? Are you ready now, Councillor Breeden? You're still muted. No. There we go. Um, thank you. Um, I'm on three different three different computers at once. <laughs> thank you so much. 
Um, I also wanted to, my concerns were also around the um, uh, echoing what uh, Councillor Asami George was saying about Madison Park. That was one of my big questions. And um, let's see, that's all for now. She, she got in before me on that one. <laughs> I'll come back later. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor Breed. And Councillor Janey, you have the floor. Um, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Be great. All right, I have a, a bunch of questions. Um, so I'll watch out for your gavel. Following up on Madison Park in my district, um, Councillor Wu, Councillor Sabi George, and I spent my entire first term going deep into Madison. So have lots of questions regarding the changes over there, uh, concerns, um, whether those, con those changes will disrupt the progress that we've made. Um, following up on the specific advocacy, um, we are asking for a change to the way Madison is funded um, and that we fund it as a, a Voltec school and don't treat it as just an ordinary school. Um, as well as changes to the admissions policy. And we've, the three of us, and I'm sure um, others on the council who want to join in that effort are, are welcome. So I have lots of questions around um, that. Um, in terms of, I'm just going to try to go down my list to stay organized. Um, and forgive me, I may come back to the Vogue Tech because I took that out of order. Um, so in terms of early ed, I would, I'm really interested in seeing a guarantee for every four-year-old child. And I know when BPS talks about universal pre-K, they talk about it a little differently than I do. I'm talking about a guarantee for every four-year-old in a BPS school building. And I would like to know how close we are to that. I would also be interested to understand uh, if in fact that is a shared goal or if that's just me. Um, so I know that the, the partnership around the early ed providers, whether they are family providers or center-based, and that's wonderful because I know every family doesn't want a BPS school for their four-year-old, but if they do, I want them to have a guarantee. So I'd be interested in understanding the pie chart, the breakdown from early ed seats, um, and the breakdown for uh, K, K1 seats, and I'd be interested and understanding who are in those seats by uh, race and by zip code. Um, and then I would just under, like to understand the percentage of the pie, like how many of the seats are BPS buildings versus the center-based versus the family-based. Uh, and I say all of that because there's clear evidence of, um, you know, BPS has been tracking data, or at least they did in the past, of what it meant for a child coming through BPS versus not having early ed and what that meant for future opportunity and achievement gaps. I mean, that wasn't an opportunity gap. Um, in terms of excellence for all, I'd like a breakdown of how many excellence for all seats versus how many advanced work seats, where they are throughout the district. Uh, and who are in those seats, a breakdown again by race, by language and by zip code for each grouping. And then maybe a pie chart to understand what percentage of the seats um, are advanced work versus excellence for all. And if in fact, uh, excellence for all, in my mind, there we have a multi-tiered system here. And if in fact, excellence for all is the same as advanced work, why do we have advanced work? So why are there these two different things and who are who are in each and then where are each when I looked at um, I did a quick look just before the hearing so perhaps I missed it but I didn't see any d7 schools with excellence for all programs I don't know but I'd be obviously interested in the d7 schools which ones have excellence for all which ones have advanced work class um, but I want to see the big picture for the entire city and who are in those seats as well as where are those seats located um, and then just understanding the budget implications. Are we seeing uh, uh, growth? Like, is this an increase of seeds compared to last year? Like, I just want to understand all of that. Um, I think I did talk about Vogue Tech a little bit. Um, always interested in more arts and if we can invest uh, more in arts and seeing more arts programs across the city. There's an amazing arts program at Orchard Gardens in my district and amazing art teachers there. And I'd love to expand that. 
Um, I think that's it for me for now. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks Madam so much. President. Thank you, Madam President. Um, next up is uh, Councillor Mejia, and then it'll be Councillor Edwards. Councillor Mejia? Can you see me? Can you hear me? I can see you and I can hear you. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to, I have questions. I'm going to tell you, I have questions for accelerated learning, early childhood education, Office of Elementary Schools, Office of Secondary Schools, and Excellence for All, and AWC. Is that cool? Yeah, sounds great. Okay. So in regards to accelerated learning, um, so as we know, one of the goals for accelerating learning is to make sure every student has a safe space to learn and thrive. However, we are seeing some cuts to guidance as well as uh, extracurriculars. And I'm curious to know how those cuts align with the goals of accelerated learning. In the early um, education uh, space, specifically around universal pre-K, the registration process for pre-K takes, um, takes place on a Google form. And I would like to know what security measures are in place to protect the data that is updated onto this form. I also saw that the Google form to register for, for pre-K is also available, um, able to be translated in, in numerous languages. And, and I would like to know what the response has been um, like for registration in languages other than English. I ask this because if we're seeing a lot of responses in one language as opposed to another, what kind of outreach do we need to do in order to communicate with other communities that registration is open? Um, in regards to uh, Office of Elementary Schools, we're seeing a cut in programs uh, detail for elementary education in grades one through five. What is the reasoning um, for these cuts and how will they impact students in the early stage of education? Office of Secondary Schools, we're seeing cuts for all but one BPS um, middle schools and what are the reasons for these cuts? Um, in regards to excellence for all and AWC, one of the goals um, of the EFA is to create interventions for social and emotional learning and wellness. I do also see that the health and wellness funding is being cut as is social and emotional learning. And how are we holding ourselves accountable to the goals of excellence for all? And how do these budgetary items impact that? So if we're seeing cuts in the social and emotional wellness space, I, um, I think that I'd like to get some clarity uh, around why we're seeing cuts in those spaces. And then I'm also curious, um, overall, I'm really concerned about these pathways, um, these pathway schools. We, we talk a lot about um, preparing young people to take the exam and making sure that they're ready to thrive, but I'm just curious about what are we doing um, from K through eight to support uh, not just the transformational schools, but other schools who may not fall within that portfolio to ensure that those kids are being served in the excellence for all category. Um, also curious uh, around um, the registration for early childhood education. I know that there's an initiative, um, I think it's AB, it's Thrive by Five. It's a program run out of um, Boston Public Schools uh, to help uh, with the recruitment and communication around um, enrolling your students in schools. So I'm just curious, I've seen a lot of that in English and I'm just wondering whether or not that um, program is going to extend to other um, languages. And if so, what budget is being allocated for that? And as it relates to vote tech in general, I have the same questions that I heard from um, President Janie, I'm just curious too if what if any opportunities when we're looking at vote tech um, in Madison, what opportunities if any exist to bring on other types of careers, maybe in the video production, um, graphic design, uh, just to expand on the curriculum for vote tech. And that's it for now. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Um, next up is Councillor Edwards, and then it'll be Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much. I'm just confirming you can hear me. Yep, can hear you great. Great. Um, so I wanted to first of all uh, discuss the 
I believe the superintendent had a fundraising or a, uh, a mechanism to help deal with the inequity and the ability for some schools to outraise, uh, to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, versus other schools that could not. Uh, specifically, how were we going to help with that uh, fundraising? And I believe she had a plan for that, and I wanted her uh, to fill in that gap, explaining if I think it's one we were asking years ago if schools would finally be required to report how much they fundraise. They don't have to right now. That it would go to is that money now going to go to central office? They're going to keep it in their own accounts. Um, are they going to spread it around? And so that was one thing I wanted to make sure we, we followed up on an EEC in Charlestown. I'm hopeful that we will be getting one um, uh, to complement some of the EEC in East Boston and how the EEC in or Allegheny, their relationship is going to either grow, increase, decrease. Uh, that was a big issue for the tracks that they're on. Um, and I think we do need actually expanded EEC services in, in East Boston. Uh, I guess that goes under uh, universal pre-K echoing what <clears throat> President Janey and others have said. Uh, we've been talking about it, uh, but what is the plan to actually implement it and plant those seeds uh, in either BCYF buildings or BPS buildings? Um, I'm curious about the expansion and growth of dual language programs. I know the Umana has been growing each year and we intend for it to continue to grow. I think it's the only school in East Boston that has a dual language program. Um, it's become, I believe, a flagship program, but we would, I'd love to know what the plan is to have more schools, not just in East Boston, but in Charleston and other places have dual, dual language programs that uh, start much earlier than high school. Um, I think it's been a huge success to have it starting in the first grade and to continue to grow them. Finally, um, with what is the partnership EPS is going to work on or demand with the unions, especially those working over in Suffolk Downs. It's a massive amount of jobs to be produced. And so I think that there's a real natural complementary pipeline uh, not just to Madison Park, but to all the high schools uh, for recruiting, for uh, meeting, getting to know about uh, vocational opportunities and specifically how they could start pre-apprentice or something um, in, in each of the high schools to pull some of our kids into those jobs. It's 20 years worth of work. So a lot of kids could end up benefiting a great deal by being in there. So that's all I have. Um, that's all I have for now. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Edwards. Um, next up, Councillor O'Malley, and then it'll be Councillor Arroyo, and then Councillor Flynn has also joined us. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, obviously, echo the concern that I know we all share in Madison Park Technical Vocational High School. They've announced uh, in the press about a week or so ago that they're looking for new headmasters, uh, conducting a nationwide search. I assume it'll be unlikely that that nationwide search will conclude before Labor Day. So I was wondering if there's talk about an interim uh, uh, headmaster to uh, sort of take the reins. Um, so that's something that uh, obviously is the top of uh, many of our concerns to make sure that the support is there, which I know the superintendent and the mayor share as well. Specifically on these topics, um, just going through the budget book, the external funds community partnership line has been zeroed out. I assume that means that that's just been moved somewhere else. It's not a significant amount of money. It's gone down considerably the last couple of years, but curious about that because I know that that helps bolster a lot of the extracurricular activities. Um, secondly, in the external funds, the ELT has been cut in half. Again, I know we're expanding that to more schools, so I assume that it's just elsewhere in the budget, but just looking for some clarity on that, on the extended learning time. Um, somewhat of a mixed bag of good news, bad news, as it relates to our graduation rate, the actual of 18 over 19 has decreased from 75.1% to 73.2%, and the dropout rate, uh, which is bad, obviously, but the dropout rate has uh, slightly decreased as well from 5.4% to 4.2%. So looking for strategies to both continue to lower the dropout rate, um, which quite frankly is going to be, uh, I think, some unique challenges provided by the fact that students are remote learning. What, what constitutes the dropout rate for this school year with, if we have kids who, for, who may not have access to um, online learning or the supports that others may, that's just something that we need to be cognizant of. Um, but obviously at what the uh, 
strategies to increase the graduation rate, the four-year graduation rate. I can tell you that for every year, but the last two years of my time on this body, we've celebrated an increase in the graduation rate. Boston was really a, a leader uh, for a, a city model for that, and we're seeing those numbers dip, which is obviously very, 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 to go down two percentage points is, um, is staggering, quite frankly. So one of the strategies on that. Uh, secondly, obviously the AWC and excellence uh, uh, for all education, looking at ways to both support and bolster those programs, how that changes with the reconfigured schools when we have more K to six models as opposed to K to five, what that means for AWC access or excellence for all. Um, I had asked this at uh, both an earlier working session and hearing, but I think it's more germane to this one access to the exam uh, test preparation, uh, which is typically in the summertime. This is something that we, uh, we won't be doing on site in all likelihood, but in that crisis provides an opportunity that more kids will have access to that. So I wanna make sure that we can uh, get that to as many fifth uh, and sixth graders as humanly possible. I guess it's fifth graders. And then secondly, an update, I know we've talked about this at the last hearing on um, the resubmitted RFI for uh, the uh, exam for sixth grade students, uh, where we are with that um, and ways to uh, support both our exam and non-exam high schools. Um, so that's it for this round, Madam Chair. Great, thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Um, now it'll be Councillor Arroyo and then Councillor Flynn. Councillor Arroyo? Councillor Arroyo, you're muted still. Thank you, sorry, I was trying to find the button. Uh, so I'll try and make this quick. Um, first question is what efforts uh, is BPS making to increase quality seats for universal pre-K as a percentage of demand? Uh, for some context, High Park has 34% quality seats as percentage of demand, which is the lowest in Boston. Uh, is there a portion of the budget in fiscal year 21 that addresses that? Uh, there's a 28% decrease in the Office of Elementary Schools from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21. Uh, just why why did that happen? I know some in the earlier concerns I had raised in the other hearing was because they had moved or shifted departments. So just a question as to what that is. Um, how do you determine uh, which schools participate in Excellence for All? Uh, the budget, the ele ele elementary education grade five budget is being reduced by 14%. Uh, just why is that? Uh, let's see. Um, this one's very near and dear to my heart, which is how much of the budget right now is being directed toward non-state mandated testing. Uh, that includes uh, companion teacher guides, companion textbooks, companion everything associated with whatever that test is, what portion of the budget, what's the total amount being spent on tests that aren't actually mandated by the state. Um, let me see, uh, just a, a big update. There's a number of questions on Build BPS, so it might just be good to get an update on where they are with Build BPS as far as uh, plans for the structure and grades. Is that still on schedule or has that been impacted by COVID? Um, and so those, those are basically it. Uh, I'll ask in the second round if I have any other ones, but a lot of my questions have already been asked as far as the vocational school and uh, you know, other issues that other folks have raised. So I'll wait to see if the second round, if I have to raise anything else, but I think that's, that's it for me. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Arroyo. Um, all right, Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Buck. Um, I know some of my questions were already answered, but as it relates to Madison Park, I know there was a recent article about it in the globe, but also it came up um, in the discussion as well. You know, I, I would like to know if there's a study or if there could be a study on exactly what happened over the last, you know, over the last 10 years as it relates to this high school and the changing of the headmasters um, principles, just so that going forward that we're not continuing to make the same mistakes again. Maybe, maybe some recommendations from, from a group of teachers and professional educators on, on what they see as the challenges, maybe some recommendations on 
on on how we can improve that school. I went to a vocational technical high school in Boston at Don Bosco High School. So I want I'm going to try to get more active in and more involved in Madison Park as well. Um, I would also like to get some information on one issue I, I focused on was the over the last several years was getting a nurse in every school. But I want to know what the outreach is in terms of that nurse communicating with um, families um, of students that may not speak English. Um, what what the communication is like for nurses in that situation as well with special needs students. And not only do we need one nurse, a lot of cases we might need other medical providers to work closely with the nurse and with the families and with um, children with um, special needs as well. I know there's a lot of paperwork going back and forth with the school and hospitals. So it's a time consuming process. Um, maybe one nurse is, is not enough. Maybe we need more than one nurse and, you know, a, an assistant or some other medical professional with, with the nurse. Language access is another example. I want to make sure that we're able to communicate with our, with our families as well that may not speak English. And if the, if the teacher only speaks English and the families speak another language, what are some of the ways we're able to effectively communicate with the families so that that child may get all the services that they, that they need and deserve? Um, special education programs are critical and I, I want to look at the special education programs and the physical uh, fitness programs for special needs children. How much physical fitness um, instructions and exercise are they getting? And are there ways to increase that so children with special needs, um, you know, can continue to participate in um, athletic programs and build build their bodies up as, as well. Um, I'm also a I'm also uh, focused on the the food and nutritional programs for our students, and I know our staff that provide this service to our students do a tremendous job. I just want to know what other services and help we could provide um, those people that work in the cafeterias um, and expanding the um, paraprofessionals in between jobs. I was a substitute school teacher at South Boston High School and at Charlestown High School. And I saw the, I saw the work that the substitute teachers do want to daily basis, I wanna make sure that our substitute teachers are also um, getting the training, the um, education, the experience that they need as well, and the pay. I think their pay needs to, I, need the, I think their pay needs to be increased. Certainly that's part of the union negotiation, but that's something I would like to focus on. Um, again, my question, some of my questions have already been been asked by other colleagues, so I will stop there, but thank you, Councilor Block. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Um, all right, I will do some questions for me and then we'll go back up to the top. Um, so definitely on the early education seat um, question, really share the question about, you know, I think it only makes sense for us to be doing these community-based pre-K seats as part of our commitment to universal pre-K if we're really able to get the quality standards up to being the same as the NBPS seats. And I wanna know about the progress on that. I know we've been through a couple of rounds that RFP so far. Um, I'm hoping that Dr. Sachs um, will join us for this hearing. Um, I definitely also wanna know how much they're thinking about 
you know, I represent a district with a longstanding, like just shortage of access to schools and the younger kids are, the more important it is to parents to be able to, you know, walk around the corner. And so wondering about, I've talked to them a bit about this, but the possibility of sort of like moving further upstream to try to, to try to proactively find sites and operators so that we can have community-based pre-K seats to the extent that we're doing that in a wide variety of um, places and really filling the holes where we don't have easy access to public education in the city. Um, on a similar front, build BPS, um, really do want to understand the superintendent's plan. I think all of the last, all of the major updates that the council has heard on that plan um, came prior to this new superintendent. And so I think it's an important thing for the council to understand how the superintendent is thinking about the long range capital plan. And it really is sort of beyond just the signature projects. I mean, I think we know that there's a handful of major school rebuilds and renovations that take up most of the original billion dollars. And obviously there's a lot more capital work that needs to be done in the um, school reconfiguration. So wanna understand um, how she's thinking about that. And then in sp specifically um, in my district, again, um, you know, we have, uh, we don't have any elementary schools in my district except for the Tobin um, in Mission Hill. I think there are, however, two school buildings hosting the Kinley programs in the Fenway, one in Audubon Circle and one on Peterborough Street. Um, there's a lot of interest in the community about is there a way to, you know, maybe add some housing on the big parking lots around that and use that to in some kind of housing on public assets way to cross subsidize a big renovation of the school that might be able to accommodate both those special programs and bring an elementary school back to the district. Um, I just, I really want to make sure that there's an opportunity to have some of those creative conversations as we think about build BPS, because in terms of having the whole community of the city involved in the public school system, um, the lack of seats, the fact that like when many, many parents in my district go to try enrolling their kids in BPS, that there's no school within a mile of them. Sometimes there's no school within a mile and a half of them it just has a huge impact on, um, on parents. And especially with the burgeoning number of young families in the Fenway. Um, I think that with all the new housing stock, it's time to look at that again. Um, so definitely going to be raising that issue. Um, school libraries are dear to my heart. I spent a lot of time in them. Um, really interested in kind of checking in on our BPS library plan and where we are with that and kind of whether there's an update and sort of what are the places where partnerships with BPL are working well and what are the places where we still really have that opportunity to take what might be a locked book room and turn it into a real school library. Um, I just think it's a really important refuge for kids um, and that librarians to Councilor Flaherty's point at the beginning can add a ton of value um, both with traditional books and online. Um, I think, yeah, and just, and I mean, similar, because the distance thing, I think school admission and assignment, just understanding um, more about how we could, how we could make that better and, and less frustrating for families. Um, something that I think we'll want to talk about. Um, and I want to, I want to better understand our kind of overall commitments on some of the science education, music and art. Um, you know, what, what are our goals long-term for kind of consistent access to great programming? Because as, um, you know, Council President Janie alluded to some great art programs in her district. I know there's some schools um, that my constituents children go to that have really fantastic partnerships with the Museum of Science, um, but it's not, you know, it's not consistent across the board. It's um, partnerships here and there. And I just think that like science to me is it's learning to ask questions about the world and then evaluate how to answer those questions. And it's just a super important set of thinking skills and not kind of like an optional interesting thing. Never mind the fact that it's also a great pathway into um, employment. So I just want to want to really drill down a bit on our science education um, programming and ambitions. Um, yeah, so I think that's my first round of things and share the council's general interest in Madison Park and in, it just seems like with the kind of, even even in our current uncertain climate, the kind of access to like job opportunities that we have in Boston, we should have a best in class vocational education program um, and we're not there. So, uh, oh, and then I'll just raise a few questions around the BPS revolving funds. Um, so there are three BPS revolving funds um, it, 
and I, I just want to understand. So there's the transportation one um, for which uh, I think we're, we're, it appears from the documents as though we're running a deficit in the transportation one where we're pulling in less in um, the receipts for like field trips and stuff than we're spending on this transportation. So just want to check in on that and what's going on um, with it. Then I think there's a, a tech one where we, you know, we sell old tech um, and then we buy uh, BPS compute, new BPS computer technology. Um, the proposal here is to double our the maximum annual authorization from a million to two million for this fund. Um, and I'd just like to understand um, why why we'd be increasing it that way. And also, there was a dramatic difference. It the the fund took in and spent about a million dollars in FY19, and then in FY20, it took in and spent almost nothing, less than a hundred thousand dollars. So again, just would love the sort of narrative account of what is going on there. And then the third BPS fund, um, revolving fund, um, is the facilities fund. And there last year we took in and spent about $2.2 million. Again, that's when like outside groups use the BPS facilities. And then we use the fees that they pay us to help pay for janitorial services and other things related to that after hours use of the facilities. Um, this year, that number is down. I assume that's COVID related. Um, you know, that they're anticipating it to be 1.5 million instead of 2.2. Um, but, and then we're authorizing for 2.6, just, just want to understand again, what kind of the rationale is there. So I think those are all the questions from me. Um, and now we'll go back up to the top. So Councilor Flaherty, do you have any second round questions? Yes, that, thank you, Madam Chair. Some, some of on your lines, sort of following that the, um, the excellence for all program, it obviously has kids participating in STEM. Obviously that's the wave. Um, and, uh, if you think about Boston skyline and the companies that are coming to our city, uh, STEM is going to be critical in terms of training the next generation to be able to compete, to be able to gain access to those jobs. So um, whether it's robotics, or coding, uh, you know, world language classes, um, but the Excellence for All program is only offered in specific schools. Not all of our schools have it, so it kind of contradicts the Excellence for All um, and as a result of which, just like to see uh, from them, how do we get this uh, in more schools? And uh, what's the criteria for which um, schools have it now and other schools don't. And I know there's been some discussion um, about the advanced work classes. Uh, and there's a limited number available um, in schools that actually have the AWC. And I'd like to see um, if there's a way we could expand uh, access to those seats uh, across the city. Uh, maybe identify some more schools um, that could uh, host an advanced work class program. At the end of the day, we want our students to compete in a global economy and uh, also be able to compete to get into uh, our exam schools. And I think that uh, advanced work uh, classes are, uh, are essential. And I know that advanced work classes are also not often um, in every school across the city. So, and, um, and also if we get into the, the higher schools, just get a list of on the AP side, um, you know, how much AP are we offering and uh, can we do more on that front? So again, this is, um, it's about, um, making sure that we're, we're preparing all of our kids uh, for a bright future in, in order to compete. We need uh, to really sort of push folks to be the best that they possibly can. And I think that uh, the advanced work programs uh, do that. I know my children uh, were beneficiaries of that. And also um, on the college side of the house, um, travesty here is not enough of our kids, our Boston public school kids get into some of the best colleges and universities in the world that call Boston their home. And we can and must do better in order to uh, to be able to get them to meet the minimum thresholds to get their foot in the door um, you know, at BC or BU or Harvard and Northeastern, et cetera. So that's what I'm looking at. I'm, I want to kind of push the needle a little bit here um, and make sure that we have enough access and opportunity uh, across the board. And it obviously starts as the Excellence for All program. It starts in our advanced work, advanced work programs and it starts with our AP classes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Breeden, and then it'll be Councillor Sloppy George. Uh, thank you. Um, bring this back. Um, I echo many of my concerns from Councillor Flaherty um, with regard to the advanced work. Um, we have only one school in Alston Brighton in our district that offers advanced work, that's the Jackson Men. 
um, and it is slated for closure next July in 2021. And I really would like to hear more about what the plans are for there. Um, and it says that a, an advanced work class hybrid, how does an advanced work, work class hybrid differ from an advanced work class? Um, I'm interested to know what the difference is. Um, and I also share a councillor Flaherty's concerns that excellence for all should mean all, not just um, a select few um, schools in our, in our districts. Um, back to uh, vocational track. Um, in, in Brighton High School, many of the students actually work 30 to 40 hours a week to earn money for their support their families. And I'm really questioning whether the current model um, there's a subset of students in our student, uh, students across the city that many of them are working pretty almost full time jobs to support families. And does this current school model actually work for them and or should we be looking at something different? Um, the I really feel as well that uh, the vocational track like to put all of our vocational technical education into a voc folk tech high school. Uh, that we should be offering some voc tech um, um, curriculum in, in all of our high schools to uh, expose students to um, coding and robotics and um, you know, um, pre-health care um, professional preparation as a way to um, get them on that path to really engage and, and realize that there's going to be an employment opportunity at the end of it for them and really preparing our students to go into the workforce. Not every student will, will wants to or would, will be able to go to college, but it doesn't mean that they can't access, uh, prepare well and, and get good support to, to go into our workforce. Um, very big concerns about the Jackson man and what the plans are there. Um, and then Horace Mann is the school for the deaf. 40% of the students there are from out of district. And I'm just wondering how much tuition that brings in from out of district placements. Um, I look at the tuition rate for the cost of tuition at Horace Mann per student and it looks pretty high, but I'm also looking at what, wondering how, how much money uh, tuition brings in from out of district at that school. And uh, let's see what else I've got here. Um, yeah, and we've also got two uh, excellence for alls, two other ex excellence for all schools. And I'd like to uh, explore ways in which we can have all of our schools have, be, have excellence for all in terms of uh, enrichment and um, other um, offerings uh, in the curriculum. And that's all for now. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Breeden. Councillor Savage-Yarge. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you again for everyone's questions. I think they're really thoughtful and these working sessions help us to really create some uh, deeper questions and more in the weeds. My uh, questions here are around the Mass Corps standards. And we know that Mass Corps consists of four courses in English, four in math, three in lab-based science, three history and social science, two foreign language, one in the arts, phys ed, um, as required by state law. And so I'm curious about um, how the district will be engaging teachers and staff during this transition to a new curriculum. And in particular, I have an interest, I have an interest in all of it, but science education is something in the city that we haven't been able to fully embrace, I think, and we need an increased investment in science education um, and wonder, you know, the impacts on teaching staff, both in, in science education, having the availability for a broad spectrum of um, education, and then also wondering, you know, sort of just what the plan is to move towards a mass core standard. I know that the superintendent has also talked a lot about the international baccalaureate um, programs in some of our schools. And if we're adding that, how does that impact our curriculum? How does that impact uh, teaching, how does that impact uh, student success? And I think it's a it's a really fascinating opportunity to offer our students, but what is the impact on the larger system um, as a whole? My other, um, my other question is, I, I think it was, actually, I think it was you, Chair Bach, that brought up the library piece. And I think that that's really an important question uh, because we have too many 
closet librarians, uh, closet um, book rooms that are called libraries. And then we have some full fledged libraries in our school that are just not open. We don't have access to a, a licensed and certified librarian. We don't have access or we're not utilizing a para librarian, which is a really interesting uh, program that we have in the city. So making sure that our libraries in our schools um, or partner library programs with BPL are up and running. So I think that that analysis that you brought up in the library plan is one that's important uh, as well. And I think goes hand in hand, that effort goes hand in hand, certainly with our curriculum and all that we're doing. Um, you know, want to echo the universal pre-K questions. Uh, the UPK program is one that we've demonstrated a lot of interest in as a council, uh, one that we've advocated for, you know, in partnership with both the administration and the district to, to grow. So I wonder if down, I, I wonder if we can sort of have that high level conversation in this budget process. And because of the current situation, I worry that we won't be able to get into the weeds. So I encourage the district to share uh, through their presentation as much as information as possible on that. Um, I do have additional questions around uh, build BPS and parent and youth engagement, especially the promotion of our school parent councils and our school site councils. So I'll uh, save those questions for the next round to afford more time to my uh, colleagues. But I do have one more round of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Savage George. Um, Councillor Janey. Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you? Um, I just wanted to um, affirm, I think, I think it was you, Chairwoman Bach, uh, the importance of looking at Build BPS and, and having uh, Dr. Caselius as the new superintendent to kind of uh, help us understand her thinking. So I wanted to affirm that. So thank you for that. Um, so many good questions have already uh, been, been asked here. I'm looking forward to a good productive hearing uh, and would finally just say, um, it's great to hear um, the good report of the Umana in East Boston. Uh, when I was at MAC, you know, we worked for a number of years with East Boston parents to get that off the ground and was able to see that come to fruition while I was still there at MAC. Um, so it's great to see that it's thriving and we need more of that throughout the district. I'm a big proponent of dual language. But anyway, thank you. I'm looking forward to a great conversation in the hearing. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Janie. And now um, Councillor Mejia and then it'll be Councillor Edwards again. Councillor Mejia. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, going on with round two questions. So in regards to Vogue Tech, how are we using our vocational program, specifically the new funding recommended in this budget to create a pipeline for students to careers um, in the trades within Boston? More specifically, a number of departments we have heard from so far reported problems with hiring. So I'm curious as how we can use this funding to continue to hire BPS students uh, for those hard to quote unquote fill positions. Arts and music, we're seeing an increase in funding for the arts education under the programming. How will this money be used? I'm just really curious about the, the, the allocation and where and what schools um, and what's the criteria around all that. I'm curious in regards to libraries, I'd like to hear about how we're using our libraries to reach out to students who speak languages other than English and what resources are available for conducting uh, research um, in non-English languages. Um, one of the goals for BPS um, libraries is to create a set of possible family workshops, including parent university and other literacy outreach programs. What is the status of these programs and how are they being utilized during um, COVID-19 to reach out to families who are struggling to manage their kids' schedules? Um, and education plans. And um, I'm just curious because I know that some schools have full on libraries and some schools have makeshift, um, you know, like a little cart that they bring along. So in terms of equity, when it comes to libraries, uh, wh what are we doing to make sure that all kids in all schools have access to fully functioning libraries? Um, not just a little side hallway just with an actual librarian um, in our schools. I'm curious about that. 
Um, and going back to the arts and music, I'm just curious what, if any, opportunities are being leveraged with um, universities in, in Boston to increase the art, access to the arts. So I'm looking at Berkeley, I'm looking at other schools, what role, if any, our universities are playing to help um, support the arts um, in the city of Boston's public schools. And I'm also curious as it relates uh, to, uh, I'm gonna go back to excellence for all. I, I echo the same sentiments that my colleagues have um, raised. And I'm extremely curious about um, two uh, populations. One is our English learners as it relates to excellence for all, what types of programming is put in place for, for students um, with diverse language needs. And also curious about excellence for all um, supports for uh, students who are chronically absent. And my internet is unstable and I may sound like I'm unstable, but I'm just curious as to whether or not um, you were able to hear me and have everything uh, recorded. No, it was all, it was all good. It delayed, but the audio is fine. Okay. Because um, you're frozen you all set, on my Councilor screen. Okay. Yes, I'm all set, but I'm just curious because you're frozen on, on your screen is frozen. So I just want to. Yeah, I think, um, I think everybody, I, I certainly was able to hear. Um, Candace, can you just confirm that we were able to hear on your end as well? Okay, and so yeah, this and, and Tyler, she's she present. Janie heard very clear to me. Council Bach, can right. you hear me? All right, I think we're good. Uh, yes, now yeah, I can. Okay, I could hear. I think we're good. Um, uh, next up is Councillor Edwards, and uh, then it'll be Councillor Flynn. Councillor Edwards, any second round questions? Councillor Edwards, you there? All right, see, I'm gonna jump out of Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, second round questions. Thank you, Councillor Block. My second round question, um, Council Block, revolve around build BPS. I would like to get an update on what the superintendent's vision is for BPS and what changes we might, may or may not see as it relates to the ongoing um, coronavirus and um, recession as well. I, I would also like to, I would also like to see um, and, and, and learn about the, the relationship between BPS, BCYF, and, and BHA as well. City departments, most of them, many of them I should say, um, you know, BPS have B BCYF centers located in the schools and many of the schools are physically located in BHA developments. I would like to know how we can um, ensure and programs are targeted towards the school and to uh, BHA residents that go to that school as well and participate in the BCYF programs. I also want to know if there's a um, an athletic facility such as a swimming pool that may or may not be managed by BCYF. Um, is that pool functioning for our BPS students? And can we take an and can we take an inventory of um, what facilities are in need of assistance? And with that inventory, you know, are, are students not getting services because of, um, you know, a, a swimming pool that's not working or a athletic court that's not not up to date or up to standards? 
or a playground outside that's not not being fully ut utilized because of of some damage to the the area so i'd like to learn more about all aspects of bps and how and how it impacts our our students um and then finally i i would like to learn more about um some of the public safety aspects in in our schools not only public safety aspects but uh, people co coming into the school, uh, non-students, and what their um, what the public safety precautions would be, and also what are the public health um, recommendations the schools are making when visitors do come into the school, so we're able to protect our students and and our teachers as well. Um, I would like to I would like to learn more about those issues. I think those will become prevalent and prominent as, as the semester starts again in September, the school year starts again in September, especially on public health. And finally, our playgrounds outside. I would like to know, it, it's, it's also a part of Build BPS, but a complete inventory of our playgrounds, um, how they are doing, what, um, what limitations um, are impacting our students fully utilizing the playgrounds, maybe because of damage or, or wear, uh, wear and tear or neglect. But I wanna make sure that every children has a safe playground to get some exercise, exercise in. Um, physical fitness is, a, is an important issue that I wanna to continue to focus on and I want to make sure our st students have the best um, locations, playgrounds, swimming pools, so that they can get the exercise as well as they deserve, that they need and deserve. And, and finally, um, uh, Chair Block is um, one program I especially uh, have great faith in is the JROTC program. It provides excellent, excellent leadership to our students. And I would like to learn more about that program and hope that we're not going to be cutting the JROTC program citywide for any, any reason. I think it's very effective and it helps so many, so many students. Again, thank you, Council Block. Um, and um, those are my questions. Great, thank you so much, Councilor Flynn. Um, all right, I have a couple more and then I'll just say we are going to do a third round, but I'll ask people who want to ask a third round of questions to just raise their blue hand so that, um, that you want that third round of questions. Um, all right, so I'll just quickly, the one thing I wanted to raise was um, as we move into the Common Core, um, there's a you know, good opportunity for us to offer more elective history courses to our students in addition to the world history and US history courses that they're required to take. Um, and I know that right now, I think the only one we have is a sort of 12th grade BPS civics capstone course. Um, so I'm curious uh, what plans are in the works to develop more of those history electives? I think history can be a really great way to engage students. Um, I would love to see more, more curricular opportunities there. Um, and I think obviously for some students, that's AB and IB classes also provide that, but, um, but I think there should be other BPS led curricular options there too. Related to civics, just would really like to understand um, the current state of the world on civic education in BPS. I taught civics in BPS myself through college and I uh, care a lot about that. And I know that there's a number of different opportunities in eighth grade, in high school, um, and just wanna know kind of how consistently across the board, real substantive civic education is accessible to our students. So that's my second round of questions. Um, anybody with a third round of questions? All right, I see Councillor Breeden, so we'll go to Councillor Breeden, you have the floor. Um, I, I really want to go back to my concerns about what's happening at the Jackson Man in terms of the plan. Um, the, the, the 
the plan, the need to, to demolish the building came on us very suddenly. There was, wasn't on the horizon at all. Um, and it, we're one year away and I'd really like an update on the status of the plan and how we are going to accommodate all the students at the Jackson Man uh, after July for um, July uh, 1st, next uh, 2021. Um, I'm starting to sound like a squeaky wheel, but I'm very concerned. Uh, the other issue in relation to the Common Core, um, many of our students speak uh, their native language, um, it, it, offering uh, opportunities to uh, study uh, and become literate, more literate in their native tongue and native language would be a great way to enhance the breadth and depth of our language education in schools. Um, also concerned about music and arts and should not just be an enrichment study. Uh, students who access these uh, music especially generally perform better across other, other uh, subjects. So it's really, really beneficial all around to include music and arts education as part of the uh, excellence for all program. Uh, and that should happen. Um, let's see, I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. Great, fantastic. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Um, all right, third round questions go now to, uh, um, let's see, Councillor Sabi George. I'm sorry. Councillor Sabi George. Thank yeah. you. I was switching from the headphones. To, um, so, my questions are, um, and they were asked, I think, in the overview and perhaps in the capital, uh, but I would like some more information on Build BPS both, um, you know, it's been a long time focus of mine, but I am curious about a proper timeline and a concrete budget outline on build BPS. And although it's great that we're um, implementing the My Way Cafe in many of our schools, this, um, this pot of money, uh, and we're doing, so we're doing My Way Cafe with some roofs and boilers and windows and things like that. I do think that this pot of money really was intended for a full scale capital, uh, uh, improvements and sort of on the significant end of rebuilding and uh, significantly renovating a lot of our schools. So I am curious about build BPS currently, and then also the next round of build, build BPS, where is that next billion dollars coming from? Are we starting to do some work around um, accessing or finding that next billion dollars? I also think that it's important that we do another round of a facilities audit on our buildings because a lot of our buildings, um, it's been a long time since they were audited and there were some flaws with that initial uh, report. Curious about the status of the West Roxbury uh, complex building. And um, I know that, um, excuse me, I think, guys, please. I think that it's important that um, we're, keeping that conversation moving uh, because we know that it's a long time before uh, any rebuild. It, it's a long process. So just curious on that, um, on that timeline. I brought it up in an earlier round, but really it's an apparent engagement and how we're promoting school parent councils and school site councils. And how do we really do a deeper dive and an analysis into where, um, where, where our schools don't have thorough engagement and how can we get to that point? And then BSAC has been a big focus of mine, doing some work in collaboration with the Boston Student Advisory Council. They have a student member uh, that sits on the school committee. We'd really like to see that student rep receive the same stipend that school committee members receive. It is not a, a huge dollar amount. I think it's about $7,500. And that student participates in all deliberations of the school committee with the exception of executive session. So um, there's a, a simultaneous conversation happening around that student having the voting rights, but at the very least they should be receiving that $7,500 uh, stipend. Um, and that's, that's it for me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Fantastic. Thank you, um, Councillor Sabi George. And now I'm gonna go next to Council President Janie, and then I'll just note that um, right now she's the last person raising her hand. So we'll conclude after this unless somebody else raises their hand in the meantime. So Council President Janie, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I just wanted to follow up on uh, the point that you raised earlier, Madam Chair, about uh, history uh, and thought that this was an 
a, a good opportunity to follow up another point that I made at one of our earlier hearings. I think it was on the opportunity and achievement gap. Uh, and when I, you know, so one of the things I've been pushing for, one of the things that the uh, opportunity and achievement gap policy that was passed by the school committee in 2016 calls for is a decolonized curriculum. And it, it's, we're not gonna get there by, um, in my mind, by adding uh, more history. And, and obviously I want us to add more history, but it's not enough just to add electives. I think we have to revamp the entire curricula. And I would be interested as we begin that work, which courses we could bring in to your point um, on a whole range of issues uh, maybe not as an electives, but just kind of looking at the whole social studies, history departments of our schools. So I think this is a great opportunity. So I'm just affirming uh, your point as a good opportunity for us to kind of maybe look deeper at the whole thing. Um, because I think we should be looking at civics, we should be looking at uh, financial literacy, uh, lots of areas. Um, my, I'm getting a message that my internet is unstable, so I'm gonna pause there. I just wanted to uh, affirm what you already said and say that this was an opportunity for digging deeper on looking at the entire curricula. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Madam President. Yes, and I think we seem to be having a general connectivity issue today with the video, but your what you said came through clear, um, and I very much agree. And thank you for thank you for chiming in on that. Um, next up will be Councillor Mejia, and then I see that Councillor Breeden also has her hand raised. So, Councillor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, do you want to unmute? Can you hear me and see me? Yes. Okay, I feel sorry for you. I'm having issues with my internet today. Um, all right, so in regards to the third round of questions, um, we talk about the amplifying all voices. And one of the goals for Amplify All Voices is to find the voice of parents in district um, decision-making. How is BPS going to achieve, um, how is BPS going about achieving that goal and how can we use this as an opportunity to involve parents from the very beginning? And that it's not just around, um, here's one thing that I always say is that we ask parents to show up and everyone around the table is getting paid except parents. So I think that um, if we're really serious about equity, I think we have an opportunity to create um, spaces for parents to either get trained, whether it be through um, professional development or provide some stipends uh, so that we can engage parents in ways that are more equitable. Um, I, I think that that would be something worth looking into in terms of just where we're spending our money and how. Um, in regards to parent youth um, engagement and governance role, what opportunities do we have to let parents, excuse me, to let parents and parents, uh, students and parents lead conversation as to what resources and support they need to thrive in BPS. So what's the infrastructure? Aside from just doing surveys, I'm just wondering how deeper can we go with that engagement, whether it be partnering up with some of the local nonprofits. I just really am curious to understand their engagement um, strategy, what resources are available right now for parents to offer feedback about remote learning during COVID-19. I'm curious as to whether or not there's been any, any phone calls where we're getting feedback from parents on what we can do differently in multiple languages um, and also targeting very high risk um, students, figuring out kind of like, what are we learning and what are we doing what we learn? not just from parents, but also from students. I'm, I'm intrigued by what that feedback looks like and how we're adjusting as a result of what we're hearing. In regards to Build BPS, the community engagement and events page for Build BPS still lists events, um, event timings for 2018. Obviously with COVID-19 community engagement meetings won't be happening in person, but I'm curious to know how parents and students are able to continue to provide face-to-face or monitor to monitor feedback to the school system about Build BPS. I know that there was a lot of conversation around B Build BPS and I'm still feeling um, a, a little bit confused as to where it stands and how we're moving forward and the role that 
real meaningful family engagement plays in these decision-making processes. And building BPS is not just about facilities, it's also, I see it as an opportunity to also talk about instruction, the quality of instruction across all schools, um, all classrooms. Um, it just can't be a set of schools. It has to be something that encompasses all, if we're really about all. Um, and I would also have to agree with uh, uh, Councillor um, President Janey's uh, conversation and yours, Kenzie, uh, Councillor Bach, about um, civics and classes. I don't, I don't see those things as electives. Those should be mandatory. I remember when I was in school 150 years ago, you know, I even had home ec. Um, and so I just think that we need to bring back the basics. Those life skills are important. And people talk about those things as soft skills, but those soft skills really make a big impact. So I, I would really like to see how BPS is adjusting to 21st learning and making sure that all of our students are graduating college or career ready. Um, and that includes making sure that young people know about financial literacy, uh, civics, um, and then the curriculum, as I mentioned, I don't know how many weeks ago, um, that it needs, to be, it needs to be more culturally responsive to um, the, the truth in terms of history. Um, so as part of Build BPS, my hope is that that conversation lies somewhere within um, building BPS as, as, as a quality institution. And then last, in September, the superintendent announced a brief pause for build BPS goals with the hopes of taking time for more community engagement. What is the status of this pause and how will we use COVID-19 as a platform for greater parent and student engagement? And that's it, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Councilor Mejia. Um, and yes, I agree. I think civics and, and many of these other things need to be considered essential as they are. Um, Councilor Breeden, you have the floor. Um, I want to be brief. Uh, thank you for allowing me another another question. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis has uh, just exposed the technical divide in terms of access to computers, etc. at home. And um, we've invested in that technology now to do distance learning at home learning. Um, my sense is that COVID-19, this crisis is going to continue, but it also has offered us a great opportunity to explore uh, developing that, that muscle within our uh, public school system that we could make an ongoing commitment to a robust distance learning approach that would work for some of those high schoolers that I was talking that are working 30 hours a week to support families, but also we need a commitment uh, for professional development for teachers to really develop that distance learning approach. Uh, when I grew up in Northern Ireland years ago, we had uh, Britain that have had the open university for since way back in the 60s, I think. And uh, you could get up early in the morning and take a college, you could watch a college lecture on chemistry and history or God knows what. And it was really an incredible, offering. Um, I'm just thinking we've, we're leaving so much on the table in terms of potential to um, offer um, extra education to our students outside the regular school day uh, by not investing in uh, this sort of technology. So I'm going to put that on the table. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Breeden. All right. I am um... I think we have now exhausted everyone's set of questions for this working session. I'll give everyone one second if anybody wants to raise their blue hand. Otherwise, seeing none, I just really want to thank um, all the counselors for showing up with so many thoughtful questions. We'll get them over to the administration as quickly as we can so that they've got some time to think about them. And then uh, looking forward to the hearings on the 19th of May. So thank you all so much. With that, this working session of the Committee on Ways and Means is adjourned. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all.